Welcome to City Church's On Demand Messages. My name is Josh, and we're so glad you're tuning in whenever and wherever you're tuning in from. In fact, if it's your first time, we'd love to connect with you. You can text new to the number on the screen right now. We've got a free gift for you. Also, if you need prayer, we would love to pray with you. We believe that prayer is not our last resort, but it is our first response to what is going on in our lives and the lives of those around us. And so we'd love to join in with you. And so you can text next to the number on the screen. Also, if you'd like to invest financially into the mission of City Church to be a Jesus movement that awakens the soul in the city, um, you can text next as well to the number on the screen. We believe every Sunday morning when we gather in person and online, and we open up God's word that he has something special and specific for every one of us. And so as we lean into this week's message um, that you're about to watch, we pray that God open up, opens up your heart to whatever, um, whatever he has for you. And we hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Again, if we can do anything for you, please let us know. Well, good morning. My name is E. Dozy. I'm on leadership here at City Church. And as you see, uh, Josh is not standing here. I'm standing here. Uh, one of the rhythms that Josh kind of set for just for his life and for the church is to take the month of July off. So he, him and his family are on the way to Florida to take a much needed break. So please pray for Josh, pray for his family. So this entire month, he's just going to rest and recalibrate and just really pray and seek God for the direction of our church going forward. I think it's such a great thing that he does that because, again, the church isn't built on one man. The church is built on Jesus. And that's just a great reminder to, for all of us to know that the church is not built on one person. The only person it's built on is Jesus. Not one talking head, not no one pastor is built on us and Jesus. So with that being said, he wanted to relay a very important message about somebody in our church. So he wanted to just video in. So check out this video. For the last two years, we have been working with an organization called Leadership Pathway to develop and create a ministry residency program here at City Church. This program is for men or women who feel the call to full-time vocational ministry, but just need the experience and it's a space where we can invest in them. And I'm excited to let you know that we have our very first ministry resident and his name is Jonatus Lala. Jonatus and his wife AC have been a part of this church from really the very beginning. They've got a daughter named Hazel. Jonatus and AC have um, been serving in our student ministry for the last few years. In fact, Jonatus was on stage on Father's Day as a part of our panel talking um, through uh, our beatitude for that Sunday. We are incredibly excited just to be able to invest in his life over the next two years. So Jonathan will actually start his residency in the beginning of August, and so about a month from now. And so just like any other staff member, he's going to be fundraising some for this, and it's just going to be a space where he gets to lean in and get just the experience of different ministries, what it looks like to serve, um, and really it's a chance for us to invest in him and equip him. He feels the call to full-time ministry. We affirm that call, and now we get to walk alongside of him as he continues to grow in that call. So I just want to encourage you, the next time you see them, um, just give them a high five, give them a hug, say welcome. We're so excited. We're going to be praying for you. And in fact, I want to hand it over now to Adozi to pray for Jonatus and AC and Hazel as they step into this next moment of their life, as they get to be a part of this movement with us. That's great news. We're so excited for Jonatus. We're so excited for Hazel and AC and just their entire family. Uh, they've been serving for this church for three years now, and just to see their growth, just to see what God's doing in them, and for Jonatus to take this next step to be a resident, I know God's just going to do amazing things through them. So I'm just going to pray for them. Uh, Lord, we just we thank you for, for the Lalas. We thank you for how you've just led them to this church and you led them to just take another step. Uh, but we know that they're serving in this church, but they're ultimately taking another step in your direction. So just thank you for your faithfulness in their life. We pray that during this time, they could just be overwhelmed by your presence, Lord. They could be overwhelmed by your goodness as they just take this next step of faith. We truly believe, Lord, that you're going to use them so powerfully to build up this church and to build up your kingdom. God, we just thank you for their life and just thank you for how you're going to use them, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so if you're new here or you just started coming to City Church, 
we usually take the entire summer and just dive deep into a chapter or dive deep into a topic of Scripture. Last summer, we talked about 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, it was, it's the love chapter. It's the chapter where everybody, you know, goes to their weddings and, and says 1 Corinthians 13, like love, love is patient, love is kind. So we, we dove deep into that. This summer, uh, we're starting a series, or we're doing a series called Summer Attitude, and we're going through the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are basically these blessings that Jesus kind of laid out that if you follow him, these are the things that you have to abide by in order to receive the promise of my kingdom and all the benefits that go along with that. So if you're just kind of jumping into this series, I advise you, go back and watch the previous messages. You know, go to our YouTube channel, go to citychurchgriffin.org, check out the pre- previous messages. They're so very insightful and so very helpful to what God has for us as a church. But growing up for me, summer, summer was, was the best time, honestly. Like, my attitude towards summer was so good. For me, you could never find me inside a house like some of these kids nowadays. But granted, kids nowadays, they got tablets, they got phones, they got, you know, PS5s and Xboxes. I didn't have all that growing up, so I had to be outside to have some fun. But growing up for me, you could never find me outside. Oh, excuse me, you could never find me inside. There was no homework, nothing that will, that will put a damper on my attitude. Even in adulthood, someone for me... I'm just, I'm positive. I love the summer. I get to go to the beach. I get to hang out with my friends. Work is very laid back. Um, people take vacations during the summer. It's just a great time. Last, last Monday was 4th of July, and my family and the East family went to Thomaston. There should be a picture of us. So we went to Spurl Bluff. We had a great time. This is why I love summer. You get to, Land and engage, have nurse shirt on. You can just relax and just have a good time. Like this, this picture embodies summer for me. This is the attitude I have towards summer. So we, they fished. I'm not a big fisher, but they fished. We grilled out. We tubed down the river. We jumped off giant rocks. We hiked. We did everything. It was, it was my first time, me and my wife, it was our first time by Squirrel Bluff, and we just had a phenomenal time. Okay, speak, speaking of giant rocks, so this is me throwing up the peace sign, jumping off a rock. And the reason why I show this picture is because I don't know if you can see, but the water, the water is pretty shallow. And Gage and Landon are a lot shorter than me. So <laughs> when, when they jumped off the water, everything was perfectly fine. But when I jumped off into the rock, into the water, I don't know how, but I ended up, I ended up hitting the rock. And I bruised my heel, and I couldn't walk for a week. Like, literally, like, I'm surprised I'm even walking right now. Like, I don't know. I guess it was my prayers. I don't know. But I'm walking right now. I felt like a professional athlete trying to get ready for Sunday because I was icing my foot. I was putting a heat pad on my foot. I was trying to get ready for the big day. But granted, summer brings such a positive attitude. But for me, in that moment, and even all this week, I could have easily had a bad attitude because of my foot. I literally couldn't walk. Um, my father-in-law has a cane. I borrowed his cane. If, if you would have saw me, uh, you know, a guy in his 30s using a cane to get around. But I literally couldn't walk. And that could have easily put a damper on my attitude. And I was just asking God, like, why would you let this happen to me? I was trying to stay positive. I was trying to keep a positive attitude about it. I said, God, you must want me to slow down. Maybe I'm moving too fast. I'm just trying to think of ways to stay positive in a situation. You know, I'll be remiss to think that summer for a lot of us brings a positive attitude. Because if if for you, you might think, oh, summer, heat, I'm hot, I'm sweating. My attitude meter goes from a zero to a 10 off rip just because I'm just thinking about the heat. So summer for a lot of people could be the best months or the worst months, but what if we all kind of came to the, to the same conclusion about summer? What if this summer we changed our attitude towards Jesus? What if we used this summer to really hunker down and really pursue God this summer? What if our attitude towards Jesus changed? If you believe it or not, we're more than halfway through the year. Our New Year resolutions came and gone I'm sure you, you don't, probably don't remember what your New Year's resolutions was. 
diets came and gone, our goals that we set came and gone. If you're still doing your New Year's resolutions, kudos to you because I know I'm not. But this summer provides us a unique opportunity to really hunker down and pursue God before the business of school starts back up, before work picks back up again, and next thing you know, we're in the holiday season. Thanksgiving, Christmas, traveling, just more business. And next thing you know, it's 2023, and we're setting new goals. I, I'm sorry, I know that sounds really depressing, but 2023 is closer than you think. And so what if we really use this time to really change our attitude towards Jesus? Again, I know it sounds kind of depressing to even think about 2023, but, but I want to encourage you to lean a little more on Sundays. Take notes. Be more consistent in your morning devotions. Be, be more consistent in your Bible studies. Be more consistent in your prayer time. You might, you might sound like, okay, those, that sounds good, but I don't know where to start. I don't know what to pray for. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know what to do. Well, let me tell you the story about somebody in our church. So in the month of March and April, we did, a, we did a sermon series called Here to Stay, and it's basically talking about the staying power of God. If that, if that means if we are here to stay, that means we're here to give, we're here to serve, we're here to really commit to this church and commit to God's kingdom and what he's doing in here. So with that being said, we had a commitment Sunday where we, we had a worship Sunday, we had a stage in the middle, we, we, brought our, we brought our bricks, and on these bricks were names of people that we thought whether didn't know God or didn't have a church home. And so with that, the next, over, we committed for the next 12 months to pray for those people. I know for me personally, I have somebody that's on the brick that I really want them to see to come to know the Lord but this one person took these bricks so seriously, and she was praying for these people, praying day in and day out. And God, instead of taking 12 months, God did it like that. And that person actually showed up to church not too long ago. I could just imagine the faith that rose up in that lady's life, seeing that person walk through those doors, seeing her answered prayer. What if our attitude towards Jesus changed this summer? What if we saw our relationship with God not like a chore or a checklist or something that, that is just meaningless, but what if we saw our relationship with God as something much more than that, something more, much more beautiful? What if we truly desired after God? I want us to posture our lives in the way that we can receive the promise of his spirit. So that means we have to be more consistent with God. We have to actually lean in on a Sunday morning. We actually have to be devoted to God's teachings. The first part in James chapter 4, verse 8 says, to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So taking the posture of seeking God of drawn after him is the posture we have to take in order to receive more of God. Let's decide that this summer we're truly going to posture ourselves in the way that our attitude towards Jesus changes. So the main takeaway from this sermon series is that our posture is the pathway to the promise. You've heard it time and time again. Two weeks ago, Warren talked about how we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be satisfied. And that, um, that kind of satisfies the world can offer. It only comes from God. Last time, we talked about being meek, and if you're meek, you'll inherit the earth. We talked about Wesley did a phenomenal job. For those who mourn, they shall be comforted. And then Josh kind of set us up perfectly because if you get this first beatitude, everything else will kind of follow after that. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that, and that poor in spirit, meaning I'm just dependent on God. I'm, I'm poor in spirit. I'm really dependent on God for, for everything I have. And these beatitudes, they're not necessarily a requirement. Like Jesus told us to love, 
he told us to serve. These beatitudes are not necessarily a requirement, but you could think of them like kingdom characteristics. If I'm in the kingdom of God, these are the things I'm going to display in order to receive God's promises. So today, we'll land in verse 7. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's, it's important to note the context of the scripture because Jesus was talking to people in, in, in Israel's times where the, the religious leaders, they were merciless. They were judgmental. They were very mean. So you would think like a Passover church, uh, like Josh, for example, just being so rude, being merciless, being so judgmental, coming on stage, constantly talking down on you. So when Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy, it meant a little more to them. But what does it mean to, to really receive mercy, though? Gr- growing up for me, I had two older brothers, so I'm the baby in the family. And so I could just remember walking down the hallway sometimes, my brother would just jump out the bathroom and tackle me and beat me up for no reason just because I'm the baby. Like, literally, it happened every single day. I could just be walking down the hallway, minding my own business. Out of a sudden, the door opens and I get tackled. Granted, I know sometimes I might have annoyed them or did something wrong or whatever because I'm the baby and I just do that stuff to my older brothers. But I I remember one time vividly, I did something to my brother, something that I shouldn't have done, and he put me in the headlock. (laughs) He put me in the headlock, and all I could do was just say, mercy, 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 and I was just tapping out. So, So when you think about mercy... Mercy is not getting what you deserve, because I know I deserve punishment there, because I did something I know I wasn't supposed to do. But as soon as I tapped out for mercy, he stopped. He wanted to inflict pain on me, (laughs) but as soon as I called out for mercy, he stopped. One of God's main characteristics described in the Bible is being a God of mercy. I want to read these scriptures over you. It says in Limitations 3.22, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. In Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's who God is. He's merciful and gracious. You know, if you think about the life of Israel, and you think about their journey from Genesis to the Exodus, to inherit in the promised land, they messed up time and time again. But God was so merciful towards them that he gave them another chance. And I know for me, I've messed up so many times. So many times I missed the mark. But each and every single day, God still shows me love. He still takes care of me, and I know he still takes care of every single person in this church today. Because the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Every single morning, he has new mercies for us. So when we mess up, when we don't miss the mark, his mercy is there to to overshadow all of that. His love will overwhelm all of that. The biggest way God showed his mercy is by sending his son Jesus to die for us. Think about that. God wanted to be in relationship with you so bad that he sent his only begotten son to die for you. That's the kind of compassion that he had, that he saw us in our broken state. We couldn't fix it. So what he did was he sent his son, his most prized possession, to die. That's how devoted God is to you. That's how, that's how much he wants to be in relationship with you, that he will send his son to die. I, I think about that as well in the story of Abraham. Abraham waited years, over 30 years, to receive the promise of his son. And when he got his son... God told him to go and sacrifice him, and that doesn't even make sense. But what did Abraham do? He went up to the mountain, and he was going to be obedient to God because he was devoted to him. He was going to sacrifice his only son. Well, excuse me, not his only son, but his only biological son from from Sarah. So he went up to the mountain. He was going to sacrifice his son all because God told him to, and what happened? God provided another sacrifice. But just the amount of devotion Abraham had towards God to actually go through with that. So if you think about Abraham and his devotion, how much more is God devoted to you? 
how much more does God want to see you in relationship with him? That he will send, that he will send his son. So if you're here today and you haven't really made a choice to follow after God, now is the perfect time to really make that choice. Because God truly wants to be in a relationship with you. God is truly devoted to you. God truly wants to see you and him together. He wants to save your soul. And if you're here today, maybe, maybe you're saved, but maybe you've been feeling really lukewarm. Maybe you, maybe you haven't been on fire. Maybe you haven't been pursuing God as much as you should. My encouragement to you today is to be reminded of how much God is devoted to you, how much God wants to see you thriving, how much God wants to see you blessed, how much God wants to see you overwhelmed by his love. By sending his son, God showed us that there's no extent to his mercy. And Jesus, when he came to earth, he embodied that. He embodied mercy. So when Jesus came to earth, when he was in his 30s, he had 12 disciples with him. And these 12 people, he did life with them daily. He ate with them. He taught them. He did life with them. Towards the end of his life, one of his disciples, Judas, betrayed him. He betrayed him with a kiss. I can only imagine the pain that Jesus felt in that moment. The pain of being betrayed by somebody I spent so much time with, somebody I invested all of my life in, to get betrayed with a kiss. Just the pain that he felt. And after that, the Roman guards took him, beat him, gorged him, spit on him, ridiculed him, did all these things to make Jesus feel physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain. Like he felt all of that pain. And when he was on the cross, what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God, have mercy on them, because they don't know what they're doing. So when Jesus came to earth, he embodied mercy, the pain that he had to go through, and he still showed compassion, the pain he had to go through, and he still said, Father, forgive them. So Jesus proved that there is no extent to his mercy. He was willing to do anything and everything to prove who God said he was. Again, God is merciful. His essence is mercy, and that's the promise we get to receive, and the posture we have to take to get there is to be merciful. So going back to Matthew 5, 7, it says, Blessed are those that are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And we know the, the, the meaning of the word blessed there means happy, independent of happenings. That means no matter what's going on around me, I'm good. If I don't got money to pay the bills, I'm good. If I don't got food in the fridge, I'm good. I'm happy, independent of happenings. So no matter what happens to me, I'm good. That word blessed also means spiritually prosperous. That means you're favored by God. That means you're empowered by God to do certain things. So the Greek word for merciful in that verse is elimon. And elimon translates to actively compassionate. And one commentator defined merciful as being full of mercy, just as a graceful person is one full of grace. The merciful person is one who is full of the fountain of mercy, who is full of God. So mercy moves the merciful to bestow mercy. The idea that you have received mercy from God and need to express it to others. And that makes sense to me because if you're full of mercy, you're going to actively display that mercy to other people. Not because they need or deserve sometimes compassion, but you're going to actively display it because you're full of mercy, because you're spiritually prosperous, because you're blessed. You know, it takes spiritual strength to demonstrate compassion to some people that don't deserve compassion. The only other time the word alimon is used in the New Testament is in Hebrews, where it talks about Jesus being a merciful high priest. It says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect 
so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And this is my favorite part. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So Jesus became like one of us. He was tempted like we were tempted. He was tried like we were tried. Yet he still showed compassion. So when we come to him with our prayers, Jesus is not coming from, he's not coming out of a place where he's never been. He's been in your shoes before. He's walked a walk that you walked before. So when we pray to him, God move in this situation, Jesus move in this situation, that's when he shows the compassion and it causes him to act. It causes, it causes him to act on our prayers because of the compassion that he's filled with. And that's what we need to get to as well. Being so full of the Spirit of God, being so full of mercy that it causes us to act because being merciful is actively compassionate. So being so full of mercy, it takes over your actions. When you see someone less fortunate than you, you help them out because you're so full of mercy. When you see someone is struggling with the same struggle that you've struggled with, you help them out because you're so full of mercy. If you break the word merciful down, it's not looking down on somebody or taking pity on somebody. It's actually having positive feelings towards them, positive feelings that causes you to act in compassion. There's so many stories in the Bible where Jesus um, basically displayed mercy towards people. In Mark chapter 5, it talks about a man that was demon-possessed, and Jesus drove out that evil spirit, and he said, with the same mercy I showed you, with the same compassion I showed you, go show somebody else. There's another story about a leper who, who, who was struggling so very bad, and he cried out to Jesus when Jesus was walking by. He says, Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. If you show me mercy, I know I can be healed. Jesus stretched out his hand and says, I'm willing, be healed. There's so many instances in the Bible that talks about Jesus being merciful. And it reminds me of the scripture in Psalms. It says, if you call on me in the day of trouble, I will answer and I will deliver you. These people called out to Jesus in the day of distress and trouble and Jesus healed them and delivered them. It's so powerful because God is so merciful, so no matter what situation you see yourself in, no matter where you are in life, God wants to show you compassion. He wants to show you mercy and deliver you out of that situation. Don't take my word for it. It says so in the scripture. It says to call on me in your day of trouble. Call on me in your struggle. Call on me in your weakness, and I will deliver you. That's a promise from God. There's another aspect of mercy that I found when studying this text that could be so easily overlooked. When you are merciful, not only are you actively compassionate, but you walk in forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that everyone wants, but not everyone is willing to give. Taking the posture of being merciful doesn't just stop at people who's wronged us. It doesn't just stop at people who's talked bad about us. Taking the posture of being merciful extends beyond that. It goes beyond the distrust. It goes beyond the, the, the tension. It goes beyond that, and it still shows compassion. As a Christian, that's what we signed up for. We signed up to look different. When people wronged us, we, saw, we signed up to, to have a different response. To show others who Jesus is. When you look through scripture, forgiveness and mercy are a tandem. In Daniel 9, 9, it says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Psalm 86, 5, for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy 
to all those to call upon you. So he's merciful and he's ready to forgive. You can write an entire sermon on walking in forgiveness because it's so vital to our Christian walk. You know, Peter came up to Jesus and, and said, Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive my brother or my sister who sinned against me? Up to seven times? How many times do we put limits on our forgiveness, though? How many times do we say, okay, I'm going to forgive who I want to forgive, and I'm going to forgive them X amount of times. After that, I'm done. Oh, they messed up two or three times. I'm done with them. But imagine if God was like that towards us. Uh, They sinned again. They messed up again. They drank too much. They watched porn. They cheated. They lied. I'm done with them. Imagine if God was like, like that towards us. But thank God, his essence is mercy. His essence is mercy. So each time we sin, each time we don't hit the mark like we should, he's always there with open arms, ready to take us in, ready to shower us, shower us with his love, ready to show us his mercy. I'm sure Peter thought he was saying something good. I'm sure Jesus thinks I'm going to say two times or three times, so I'm going to say seven. Jesus said, no, you forgive them 77 times. So Jesus is saying that there should be no limit to our forgiveness. There should be no extent to, 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 to your mercy towards other people. But Jesus will never tell us to forgive without equipping us to do it. And he would never tell us to do something that he wouldn't do himself. So when you think that you don't have any more room in your heart to forgive, that's when Jesus can come and expand your capacity to forgive. That's when his spirit comes in and overwhelms you and enlarges your capacity to forgive. Because Jesus, in him, there's no extent to his his mercy. There's no extent. Remember in Hebrews, it says that he's the merciful and faithful high priest. So he's able to sympathize with us. He, He walked like we walked. He went through what we went through. So he's able to sympathize with us. So he's able to come into our hearts and really expand our capacity to forgive. But... This is so serious because Jesus says, if you have any unforgiveness in your heart, forgive them so that God can forgive you. Do do you see the tie there? Our verse today is, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You can just replace that with forgiveness. Blessed are those who forgive because they will be forgiven. But missing this is huge. We don't want to miss out on on unforgiveness. We don't want to mess with unforgiveness and not showing mercy. If the posture we take is a pathway to the promise, if we refuse to to not have the right posture, it will prevent us from inheriting the promises of God. So not being merciful to someone may seem good in the moment, But when it's your turn to receive mercy, it's a lot harder to receive. In that moment of you not showing mercy, that's your reward. That feeling that you get of being right, that's your reward. Winning the argument is your reward, and you completely miss out on the promise of God. You miss out on experiencing his presence. Not forgiving someone or holding on to a grudge may seem good, but it's all bad posture. And the thing about bad posture is you don't really see its effects until a lot later on. You know, keep slouching. When you get a lot older, it's harder to keep your back straight. Keep not forgiving. It's comfortable. Slouching is comfortable, but we don't see its effects until we are the ones who need mercy, until we are the ones who need to be forgiven. Because face it, we all make mistakes. 
we're not perfect. But by having the right posture, Jesus is inviting us to experience his kingdom right here and right now. We get to experience a comfort that only comes from him when we're lonely and sad. We get to experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. We get to experience a mercy when we don't hit the mark all the time. All because we have the right posture. So my prayer today is that we truly take the posture of being merciful so that we can receive the mercy from God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for just the promise, the promise of your presence, the promise of your spirit. God, we thank you that we get to truly receive you when we have the right posture. So I pray that these words truly has left a mark in people's hearts and minds to have the right posture to truly seek after you, to truly desire you this summer. God, I pray anybody here who may be struggling with unforgiveness, I pray that they will take a step of reconciliation today in Jesus' name. That, Father God, by the illumination of your word, As your word has been spoken today, I pray your spirit that we begin to stir hearts and stir minds in this place. God, we don't want to live with unforgiveness. We want to be forgiven. We want to receive your mercy. So I pray right now that unforgiveness leave now in Jesus' name. It does not belong in our hearts. It does not belong in our mind. I pray right now for a release for the people that's holding on to unforgiveness, I pray a release right now in Jesus' name. For the people holding on to grudges, I pray a release right now in Jesus' name. I pray for mental shackles to be loosed right now in Jesus' name. I pray for a freedom in this room right now because God, you are our desire. You are the prize. So I pray right now for anybody struggling with unforgiveness, holding on to the past, I just declare freedom over you right now in Jesus' name. Freedom that only comes from God. Freedom that only comes from His Spirit. I declare freedom right now. You are not bound by your past. Oh, You are not bound by your past. You are not bound by what that person did to you. No more in Jesus' name. There's a freedom in this room. There's a freedom in this room. I pray that your heart would be open to receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen.